Joho Makonen from Share Tribe of how to make platforms accessible and talking about a new form of ownership. So Juho, if you want to be invited, we'll just pinpoint you. There you are. Hey Juho. All right. Hello, Alistair. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so it's great to be here. Uh, let's let's see if I manage to also share my uh, share my screen. So attempt, attempting that now. All right. I think I'm gonna move this a bit. And here, can somebody confirm if they can see my slides? Yes, confirmed. Perfect. Hey, so uh, today I'm going to be talking to you uh, about uh, different ways of making the uh, platform technology accessible. And I'm also going to be talking about the, uh, about a new old but new way of uh, like a ownership uh, model that I think could suit uh, regenerative platforms uh, well. Uh, so uh, starting from a bit of a teaser, <clears throat> so I, I run a startup company, and but it's quite an unusual startup company in, in a couple of ways. Uh, for instance, our company cannot be sold. There's no way today uh, to sell it. it. It also cannot be taken public, and it also cannot pay uh, dividends. So uh, one might ask, uh, why exactly is this? Why on earth? Would somebody create a, a, create a startup company with uh, such premises? Uh, so I'm going to answer that eventually. Uh, but let's uh, first start with some uh, background and history. Uh, our company, Share Tribe, uh, builds software that helps entrepreneurs and organizations to be, create their own marketplace platforms uh, quickly and affordably. So basically, we are a software for making platforms, uh, in short. I personally have been building platforms for the past uh, 13 years, and this was my first one. Beautiful design I made it myself uh, for the university campus of other university in Helsinki where I was studying. It was a peer-to-peer -peer platform uh, before the sharing economy or platform economy as terms existed. It launched back in 20, 2009. Uh, so we were a bit ahead of our time, uh, maybe in some ways. Uh, and then <clears throat> when we were doing that at the university, at some point we saw, start showing the rise of the sharing economy or the platform economy, these terms uh, slowly taking shape. So we saw the rise of Airbnb, uh, Uber, like Etsy, all of these, these platforms. And, and I remember that when I first see, saw this, my initial thinking was, that's great. Like, this is great uh, for the world. Like that uh, basically you, you would have this initial premise that, okay, it simply allows people a way to save money, make more money. It's great for the environment because the underutilized assets are being used more efficiently. And it's also, it creates this more human faced economy and, and all that. So this was the initial naive kind of like an excitement phase that maybe, maybe some of you also uh, recognize uh, roughly 10 years ago. And so the original mission of our company then became uh, to essentially help the whole world share. We just wanted to make it possible for anybody to build this type of like a sharing platforms and that's what our first product did so in 2014 we launched shutter go uh, the idea was that you would be able to without any coding to create your own peer-to-peer -peer marketplace in one day uh, without technology skills uh, and today like our software is powering many uh, platforms that i would say fall into the uh, genre of like regenerative platforms uh, for instance uh, just naming a couple of examples so you know what I'm, I'm talking about so for instance this is a platform a bit like etsy but it's only for the uh, Native uh, Americans to sell properties uh, that, like, uh, that they've made. And they are all, all authentic and verified properties and all the money goes back to the uh, Native community. So this is a US-based platform. Uh, this is a big corporation from Denmark. It's a bit like Airbnb experiences, uh, but it's only for nonprofits uh, to offer experiences where you can uh, like a book a, a course or a workshop let's say to discuss how to fight food waste or how to fight like, or, or how to preserve oceans or, or things like that. So, so basically uh, you, using the familiar methods uh, like for, of these platforms for, for good things. And, and this platform Regenera uh, from Peru uh, is connecting uh, people who are preserving the local protected lands in Peru 
and people who fund, fund these organizations by, by donating them. So talk about the regenerative uh, platform. Uh, just, just a couple of like very quick examples. So today our software powers in total like more than 1000 platforms in, in 70 countries around the world. All, all well and good, uh, except like so at some point we arrived around this question and that I think very much this, this uh, discussion here today is about is the platform economy beneficial to the society? Uh, are these platforms really just like extracting more, uh, more than they are giving? giving and what should we do about that? And, and we started, maybe it's around 2014, 2015, looking more critically uh, at these platforms that we initially were excited about, Airbnb, Uber, and Etsy. I'm gonna take those same examples. So if you look at their original promise, uh, and then if you compare them to the reality of the public company, all these are public, publicly, uh, public companies today, uh, you see that those are quite different. With Airbnb, the whole point was about underutilized assets, the better used. So you no longer need to build hotels because like, you know, like people's uh, spare rooms or mattresses are turned into hotel uh, rooms. And what happened in practice is that nowadays, low income people are expelled to suburbs while the landlords are turning their like properties into vacation rentals. That's what's happening in many big cities around the world today. In Uber, uh, original promise you don't need to own a car like people who have cars can can become drivers and and suddenly like one car can suddenly be enough for 10 people so dramatically reduce uh, traffic congestion uh, like great for the environment public company reality first of all like many many problems with uber most drivers live, live uh, below the power line but also it actually increases congestion when all those drivers looking for work are just driving around the city uh, like causing more traffic uh, in the streets. So it's really like causing the opposite of what it actually was aimed to solve. Etsy, uh, originally it was about like people selling only handmade items uh, and it was big, big corporate, like it took this certificate to like preserve its mission. Uh, today, uh, Etsy also sells factory made products and it just gave up its uh, B Corp certificate just as easy as it's retained it. So I think all of these examples really show that when you build this kind of like a giant platform and, and you use lots of like venture capital money to propel that. And you have a structure where eventually uh, that money starts controlling like your next actions, the original mission can quite easily become distorted, even if the original founders would have been like very mission driven from the beginning. So we really started thinking about like, how do we get the benefits of the sharing economy of the platform economy? Uh, there's clear benefits, there's economic benefits, there's environmental benefits, and, and there's social benefits. So how do we get all that uh, like without its downside? So basically without the, uh, without the concentration of wealth, uh, like without uh, precarization of work and, and deepening the class divide. So as Chan said, like, instead of just looking at these negatives and, and just like looking out of fear, how can we get something to say yes to, like something positive, like a positive message where we do get those benefits, uh, but not these downsides. Uh, so <clears throat> it became our mission to uh, do something about this by just saying that, okay, can we, if we make this platform technology like accessible uh, to everybody, like hopefully it will result in a situation where we don't only have these giant dead star platforms, but actually it will be become suddenly possible for small and medium sized businesses, for social enterprises, for nonprofits, for cooperatives around the world to build their own platforms like without a huge amount of capital since that capital seems to be what's causing many, many of those problems. So if we just make that easy, accessible, possible, like maybe we will actually see uh, thousands of local platforms drive instead of these giants. And, and we uh, got excited about this mission and, and we would start going around the world, uh, like telling everybody that this is, this is what we are gonna be doing. And, and really often the response we would be getting that, okay, what prevents you from becoming one of them? Like, aren't you just another startup that has like mission driven founders, but also some investors and eventually you're gonna be also controlled by VC. Uh, and, and suddenly you you will be, if you grow big, then you just go public and suddenly you're one more extractive platform giant. And, and like, what, 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 what's your answer to that? And, and to be honest, like at the time, we didn't have a good answer. Like, they were essentially correct. Obviously, we would say, that, no, no, like it just never happened to us. We will never sell out. But how, how could we really like prove that? Like we had a traditional startup structure, uh, just like all those other companies. And we had an investors, even we had a one VC investor 
they were not controlling the majority of the company, but if we, we knew that if we raised more money, things would change. Uh, and we were really pondering this question. And, and that's what when we discovered uh, like a company structure that is to, today being called a steward ownership. Uh, this is actually a really old way of structuring companies, but nowadays there's a group of people who have uh, kind of like a zone, seen some certain uh, commonalities between various different uh, companies over that have been created over the in, in uh, even in 1900s uh, and then and, and, and they have basically created this label to kind of like kind of like show the common uh, like features of all these platforms and and that's what steward ownership uh, stands for today so basically it's a way of organizing companies in a way that their incentives uh, of the management is will always be uh, prioritizing purpose uh, over profit so there are two common principles uh, for that one is that profits are a means to an end so it's basically the social enterprise principle uh, essentially so basically uh, you, the purpose of the company is not uh, to generate uh, profit for the shareholders. The purpose of the company is to do something that benefits the society. And, and the only reason it's making profits is because those profits help you get there. Uh, the principle two is that ownership means entrepreneurship. Uh, so what is meant by this is that the power uh, of like making decisions within the company should always remain within the company itself. It should not be owned by people who are not working uh, for the company. It should not be like, like what is this today in most public companies, which are just owned by uh, like uh, faceless uh, investors around the world. So, uh, and this is the other, other key principle. And we ended up uh, restructuring our company in a major way, like and adopting this new structure back in 2018 uh, to essentially be able to have a better answer to that question, to really give a binding promise to all these stakeholders. Like we will never sell out. We won't become a, an extractive platform. Uh, so, uh, in practice, what does this mean? Uh, we have a structure where uh, voting rights can only be held by active members uh, of ShareTrade team, only people who are working at our company. Our company can never be sold or taken public uh, in a traditional sense uh, because of the previous. And also, uh, our profit distribution salaries are capped. Uh, that basically means that there's only, uh, like, it's possible for us to still have investors, and uh, like some of our profits can go to those investors, but only up to a predefined cap. And after that, 100% of our profits will go to advance our mission. And this structure is made permanent with a foundation set up. So even if we decide to change our minds later and say, no, wait, actually, we want to maximize profits, it will no longer be possible. Like, we cannot change this. This is a permanent structure. And what's really great about this is that it's possible to transition into this structure from a traditional company structure, whether you're a startup or a large company, and it's fully compatible with legislation of every EU, EU country and also in the US. And there are many, many companies, like even quite big companies who have made such a transition. Uh, it, the way it works for us, I, I go a bit more into the nitty gritty details. So we have four classes of shares. They go in two groups. There's voting shares and all the voting shares, they have no rights to profit sharing whatsoever. And, and meanwhile, we have shares that have some rights to profits, but they have no voting power. So this is the key principle that you separate these two. So we have the A shares, uh, and those are only held by active working members of the team. Then we have there's a B share, and this is given to the foundation. So basically the only purpose of the foundation is to veto any change that would like, uh, like dismantle the structure. So it basically protects the structure. Then we have C, uh, uh, and this is held by Purpose Foundation, uh, like created by Purpose Network in, in Switzerland. Uh, then we have C shares, and, and these are held by our investors. So we raised uh, money with the structure, and how it worked uh, is that we sold shares in that round for 20 euros a piece. And, and like we promised that they eventually the company will be, the company is bound to use 40% of its profits to buy back those shares for five times the original purchase price. So our goal is to buy all of them back in 10 years. So you get 100 euros per share uh, in 10 years. So it's still a very solid uh, profit, but it's not like an infinite uh, 100x profit that the VC funds are, are often striving for. And then there are these shares. Uh, so these compensate the early stage founders and early stage employees of the company who put in some free labor or really cheap labor. So it's possible for them to get compensation uh, of their work. Uh, so kind of like a, called a delayed compensation. So with this model in May 2018, like we did a crowdfunding round and, and more than 400 people from 42 countries invested. Many of them are friends, our family members, and most importantly, our customers. And we raised more than 1 million euros 
And with that, we actually ended up buying out the shares of our existing investors to allowing us to transition into, into this new structure. Uh, so if you look at the, the, our outcome, so it, we've been now three years in this structure. So we had time to analyze, like, was this a good idea? Pros and cons. There are definitely some cons. First of all, like we cannot raise funding from traditional VCs and some agents, so it does limit ourselves in that way. But that hasn't been a really true problem for us. We also can't compensate employees or board members with equity, so there needs to be other reasons for them to join our company. And our own payoff is limited. We cannot be super rich. Uh, so if that's what we wanted, this probably wouldn't be the right structure. But if on the pro side, really, there's, first of all, there's the binding promise that I mentioned to all stakeholders, we won't sell out. And really, we are in control. We, are, we have the freedom to pursue our mission without being like forced by external stakeholders to actually do something different. We are able to prioritize uh, purpose over profit. And every member of our team has the incentive to do good. We will never end up creating a structure where the incentives would, would force them to essentially maximize profit in a way that actually wouldn't be beneficial for the society. So as a summary, this, this just uh, feels right. So for us, definitely, uh, the pros clearly outweigh the cons. And I think this is, good, this is one of those models that I think could be adapted by many platform organizations today uh, like that are struggling with these questions. And I hope that it will help create a more uh, regenerative uh, platform economy. So with that, I, I'm going to end my presentation. Uh, thank you all so much. Wow. Joho, so first of all, thanks. And again, it was really three seconds on 15 minutes.